Tonight's topic deals with confronting the cults for Christ. In about 13 years, and I, by the end of this year it will be the 14th year that I've been working on religious movements and cults in America, I've been working with them to try to reach them for Christ. The interesting thing has been that there have been about four general areas in which we have had our major problems in trying to reach them. And so, to begin with, in our cult series, I'd like to explain to you these four basic problems and tell you that you need to do some work in these areas if you really want to reach these people today. And this will lay the background for what remains in the week ahead because I'll be using these areas and I'll be demonstrating them in the various cults as to their importance and why you need to know them. So with that in mind, let's go into these problems and see if we can understand them and really get a grasp of what exactly our task is that's before us that we have to overcome. The first area that we face in problems has to do with the area of language. Language. Language is a tremendous barrier for us when we're dealing with the cults. One thing that we do to begin with is that we automatically look for Christian terms as cultists speak or write, but generally we have a bad habit of interpreting the words they use with our meaning and thereby making them Christian and not taking the time to understand what they mean by the words. You see, a word itself is a linguistic symbol. The word God, G-O-D, three elements, three symbols. What you mean by that linguistic symbol depends on the content that you give a word or the context that you use it in. Therefore, somebody could take that linguistic symbol, that word God, and use it in one context and mean one thing by it, and somebody else could use the word with different content in another context and mean something else by it. And one of the things you've got to learn today is to sit down and understand what people mean by those words, how they're using them. Because if you don't, you're simply going to accept everyone as being Christian. And you're not going to discern the differences that are there. And there's going to be no communication. There's no evangelism. If there are no differences, there's no need to go any further. But one of the things we have failed to do is to understand what people are saying by those terms. And I think we need to recognize that to begin with tonight. Now another problem in this language area has to do with the mindset. Not only do these people use our terminology, that's what makes it so difficult, and they sound like us, but these people also have a habit of taking our terminology when we're witnessing to them and interpreting it in the light of their theological understanding. This happens in everyday communication. A few weeks ago, I was running around the house looking for a TV guide, and I yelled upstairs to my wife and I said, Becky, where's the TV guy? Now, you all understand what I'm asking for? Where's the TV guy? So help me, the answer I got from upstairs was, there's one sheet in the dryer, Jim. <laughs> now, you understood clearly what I said. How does it come out the other way? It's very simple. My wife was working on the laundry. Her mind was wrapped up and involved in that. The words that I speak, though as clear as they may be, are simply turned around because of the activity and thinking that she's doing at that moment and the answer comes out all screwed up. But that's exactly the problem you face with the cults today. You can say the right things, you can quote biblical passages, and so help me, you'll hear cultists say, oh, but Mrs. Eddy says the same thing. Oh, Sun Myung Moon means the same thing by that. We believe the same thing that you do. And they're playing a game. These people have reinterpreted Christianity into their structure and therefore they have reinterpreted what you've said and they've tried to make it sound like theirs. You must not let people get away with that. You must be careful in communicating the gospel today that you understand what they mean by their words and more than that, than when you're witnessing to them, they understand what you mean by those words. And so I'm calling upon you to recognize this problem. Now this is a problem that we face also in the early church. And I'd like you to turn to that first passage in Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. I want you to look at those verses that I've pointed out. Acts chapter 14, verses 8 and following. In Acts chapter 14, verse 8, we read this. And at Lystra, there was sitting a certain man without strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, 
who when he had fixed his gaze upon him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. Here's a congregation listening to the great Apostle Paul. Paul is preaching the gospel message. Here is a demonstration of the power of Almighty God. The people listen, they hear, they see the demonstration of the power of God, and how do they interpret it? How do they understand it? Well, take a look at verse 11. And when the multitude saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, The God of the Bible has done a tremendous thing. Let us come and worship Him. Is that what the text says? Oh no. Oh no. These people had a religious basis. And what they simply did was to reinterpret what happened and what they heard in the light of their religion. Notice. The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. These people heard the right words, they saw a demonstration of God's power, and they simply reinterpreted it in the light of their religious understanding. Now in verse 14, notice, when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they knew right away what happened. They tore their robes, rushed out into the crowds, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We're also men of the same nature as you. And we preach the gospel to you in order that you should turn from these vain things or empty things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Paul says, you've misunderstood what we said. You've reinterpreted it. You have to see it in the light of God who made the heavens and the earth. And even saying that, look at verse 18. Even saying these things, they with difficulty restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. It's a very, very difficult situation today to witness because of the religious frameworks of people that we encounter. We use the right words, they reinterpret what we're saying. It comes out all different. And we have a tremendous challenge to be discerning to see what people are doing to the language that we use. We have to make sure that the gospel message goes through their mind and comes out the other side as it's presented in the Bible. And that's a very difficult task today, but it has to be done. Now how can that be done? The only way that it can be done is simply to point out that there's a difference. To say, here's what you believe, here's what Christianity is all about. You have to do that. Listen, if there's no difference, there's no communication, there's no evangelism. I've had the problem many a time on a college campus of talking on Eastern religions. Montclair State University one time, I remember giving a lecture, a young man stood up, he said to me, but I love you. He said, and we're really saying the same thing. He was in Zen Buddhism. I said, that's interesting considering the differences I've pointed out. You look for salvation within yourself and you die within yourself for the answer. I look for my salvation externally. The person of Jesus Christ who makes me right before a personal, holy, righteous God. He said, I find you intolerable. My daddy stomped out of the place. And several Christian organizations said to me that I was unloving. I'd like to defend myself. It's the most loving thing in the world that you can do to point out differences to people. Because if you don't, those people will go to hell thinking that they believe the same thing that you do. That's right. They'll go to hell and you will have helped them on their way because you never discerned that they meant something different by it. You've got to learn today in witnessing to watch the language problem, to watch that mindset that reinterprets things and makes it come out different. And it's a difficult task to work on. In the book uh, of Acts chapter 17, if you turn over there, Paul uses the same basic uh, approach again on Mars Hill. In verse 16 we read, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. And some were saying, What would this idol babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities. 
modern interpretation, you know, he isn't saying the things that we usually say. He's saying something different. Now notice, what was it? Verse 18, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They couldn't take what he was saying and box it in their religion. They were having trouble. And so in verse 19, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. You are bringing some strange things to our ears. We can't comprehend them. They don't fit our box. They don't fit our religion. What is it? We want to know, therefore, therefore what these things mean. Then the account on Mars Hill is, is an interesting account of Paul's discernment. Paul simply talks about the unknown God using their basis and says, there's a God who made the heavens and the earth. That's distinct from what the Greeks held. People are made in the image of that God, not merely out of the ground that is here. Jesus Christ relates to that God, not merely the pantheon of gods. And resurrection is true. Jesus rose from the dead. These people held reincarnation. Every doctrine was different. It was different. Now you get the point that comes from this when you show differences though, when you look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. Listen, there are always those people when you begin to show the differences to say, ah, it doesn't mean anything or anything and uh, we shouldn't bother with it. But, verse 32, others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. Because the moment you start to show differences, people will begin to see that there's a difference and there'll be an opportunity to work with them. It's important. You have the beginning of evangelism. But on the other hand, in verse 34, some men joined him and believed, among whom also was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. There were people who saw the difference, understood the superiority of Christianity, and came to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Listen, we've got a tremendous problem today with this. It all has to do with the fact that we preach the gospel to people. We can use the right words, the right verses. You'll find out it will go through their minds. And by the time they're finishing reinterpreting it, it will come out totally different than what you were talking about. For example, we'll use the passage, the word was God, in John 1.1. 1, 1. By the time it goes through a Jehovah Witness's mindset, it will come out the other side, the word was a God. They will reinterpret everything that you're saying. And if you don't sit down and start to put them to the test and point out the differences, you're not going to go anywhere. Watch the people who reinterpret things in their mind. Understand today, it's a language game. These people use our language, but in a different structure with different content, and they mean different things by it. And when you talk to them and use biblical language, they will simply reinterpret that in the light of their theology. And that's one of the problems we have to overcome. We simply have to get to the place of saying, here's what you believe, here's what Christianity believes, now let's examine them and see which one is true. And that's what we have to get to in reaching these people. Now the second area here that deals with this is hermeneutics. Once we've shown the differences that do exist, and we begin to work on it, the natural place that we're going to fall is into the Word of God. And we're going to work with many different cults right on the pages of Scripture. But the second great problem that comes today are these people that say to us, that's your interpretation of the Bible. Did you ever talk to a Jehovah Witness or a Mooney or a Mormon about the Bible and they say that's the way you interpret it? Well, the ultimate question is, who's got the correct interpretation? Listen, if you don't know how to interpret the Bible properly, you will never be able to witness to these people today because they're going to throw off your interpretation and reject it unless you can demonstrate why it's true and theirs is false. And one of the key things that you have to start doing today is to take these cultists in the pages of the Word of God where they use passages and to show them that their interpretation could never be the possible interpretation, that it's wrong. And let me tell you, it's going to sound good, they're going to sound very rational, but you're going to have to demonstrate that they're wrong and you're going to have to leave them with the scar that there is no other answer but the one that the Bible presents that Christianity proclaims. Let me illustrate this, for example, in one of the passages in the Gospel of John. The passage is found in John chapter 10, and in that passage, perhaps we can illustrate a little bit of this problem. John chapter 10, verse 30 is the passage that I want you to look at. And this is a passage that we debate with the Jehovah Witnesses many a time, many a time. 
In John chapter 10 verse 30 reads, I and the Father are one. Six simple words to that particular passage. And yet, if you look at the interpretation, the Jehovah Witnesses will say, yes, Jesus said, I and the Father are one in purpose. If you look at the Christian interpretation, yes, Jesus said that God, the Father and I, are one in essence, or Jesus is deity. Now, who's right? Is the Jehovah Witness right in saying that Jesus is one in purpose with the Father? Is that what the passage means? Or is Christianity right in saying that he was talking about a deity? But we begin to look at this passage and to work. And let me simply say, begin to look in the context around the passage. Good place to begin. Number one, it gives you some time to think. Number two, you might find the answer there. But always read the context and work on it. Well, as I begin to look at that passage, I come to verse 31. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jehovah Witnesses say, I and the Father are one in purpose. Tell me, who in the world would stone somebody for doing God's will? Did you see the Jews running around stoning the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees for doing the Lord's will, as they said? Who stoned somebody for doing God's will? Kind of absurd. Kind of absurd. Let's go a little bit further with this. Verse 33. How did the Jews understand what was taking place? How did they understand what Jesus said? Well, the Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. How did they understand it? They understood Jesus' claim to deity. Now the Jehovah Witnesses at this point says, Well, you see, the Jews misunderstood what Jesus was saying. They misunderstood it. Well, then let Jesus tell you what he meant by it. We get down to verse 38. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. I don't care how you slice it. Number one, nobody would stone somebody for doing the Lord's will. Secondly, the Jews understood, understood that he claimed to be deity. And thirdly, Jesus says very clearly in verse 38, The Father is in me and I in the Father. There's no way that you can escape the conclusion. No way. He's talking about his deity. I think if you simply take the answers that they give and eliminate them, show them how they just can't fit the context, how they're absurd. Jews would never stone for that. Take the five stoning laws in the Old Testament. You will simply destroy their answer and you'll leave them pressed looking for an answer and hopefully as they consider the Spirit of God will use the only final alternative and bring them to a conclusion I had a student last year that did one of these in John chapter 8 and it was very interesting to note that the congregation overseer said to him at the end he said um, uh, to him finally that he had no answer and uh, this fellow said do you have any other possibility and he said no he said, will you admit then that Jesus is deity? Congregation over said, absolutely not. He said, can you give me any other possible theory that might explain it? He said, no. He said, will you accept then what it says? And the man still said no. But you know, you're left with a tremendous scar because you'd be working for a long time trying to figure out what that answer is. Let me give you another illustration of this in Ezekiel 37, which has to do with Mormons. Ezekiel chapter 37. Verse 15 and following. In Ezekiel 37, verse 15, we read, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, And you, son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it, for Judah and for the sons of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them for yourself one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. Now, Mormons will use this passage to teach that the Bible and the Book of Mormon complement one another. How do they do that? You take one stick right on it for Judah, for the sons of Israel as companion. That's the Bible, the Old and New Testament. You take another stick and write on it for Joseph. Who's Joseph? Joseph Smith. The stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel. That's the Book of Mormon. So when you take the Bible and the Book of Mormon together, you have the essence of Mormonism. Now my question here that I've used with many of Mormons is, is that your interpretation? They said, absolutely. I said, fine. Let's go down and look at verse 19, or verse 18. 
when the sons of your people speak to you saying will you not declare to us what you mean by these things say to them thus saith the Lord couldn't be any clearer behold I will take the stick of Judah of Joseph which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel as companions and I will put them with it with the stick of Judah and make them one stick and they will be one in my hand and the sticks in which you write will be in your hand before their eyes and say to them thus saith the Lord God behold I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone I will gather them from every side bring them into their own land I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel one king will be king for all of them they will no longer be two nations they will no longer be divided into two kingdoms here's your dilemma Mormonism says interpretation Bible, Book of Mormon God says interpretation you ask me thus saith the Lord it's going to be taking the two nations and bringing them back under one king one nation the restoration the Jewish tribes now, which would you choose? If you accept the Mormon interpretation, then you're saying God is wrong. And if you accept God's interpretation, then Mormonism is wrong. I have Mormon bishops who are still trying to come up with an answer to this particular problem and dilemma. And I tell you, if they sit long enough looking at it, they're going to convert <laughs> because it's going to eat away at them. But you must be able today to utilize the scriptures to be able to show these people that their interpretations are wrong. One of the biggest problems today is people who simply say that's the way you look at the Bible. You interpret it that way. We look at it differently. Who's got the right interpretation? And you have to simply know why you interpret passages the way you do. Why you come to a conclusion. And you have to demonstrate that for these people to bring them to truth. To bring them to truth. In the book of Acts, one passage, Acts chapter 17 gives you a little bit of this problem in the early church. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 to 12. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. How would you like to be in Paul's shoes? To walk into this particular synagogue of people who are more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. They sat there with the Old Testament, checking out to see if your interpretation was true. If what you were saying was right. And Paul had to demonstrate to those people on the pages of the Old Testament that Christianity was true. And he was able to do it because if you look at verse 12, many of them therefore as a result believed. As a result of what? As a result of Paul being able to show them on the pages of Scripture the truth of what it said. And listen, you're not going to be an effective witness today unless you can demonstrate the truthfulness of your interpretation of the Word of God. That's where the battleground is. When you talk with a Jehovah Witness and with Armstrong and others that hold the inerrancy and the inspiration of the Scriptures... The whole battleground settles not on whether the Bible is the Word of God, but how you interpret it. And if you're not ready to meet that battle, you better begin to prepare now. Because that's where the battleground is sitting. So, to begin with here, you need to distinguish, to show differences, watch the language game. Begin to communicate, show the differences, present differences so that people will see the distinctions. Then you can begin to show them why Christianity is true. Once you get on the pages of Scripture, you better be able to know how to interpret the Word of God and to show people why your interpretation is true. Because that's going to be essential to reach these people for Christ. The third area that we need to look at in the problems has to do with sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Once you've shown the differences... Once you're able to show passages in the Bible to demonstrate this is a true interpretation, to continue on, one other area that you need to develop today from the pages of Scripture is how to explain doctrine to people. If there is one question I get all the time from so many different religious groups, it is always when witnessing to them, listen, would you give me a reasonable explanation of the Trinity? 
If I were to ask you that question tonight, or bring a cultist in here who asked you that question, could you begin from the scriptures and give them a reasonable explanation for why the doctrine of the Trinity is true? Could you do it? But you see, you really need to develop that area. You really need to know how to express doctrines. Now the doctrinal area here has two basic advantages for us. Two of them. Number one, you cannot be a discerning Christian and make judgments of that which is correct doctrine and that which is false doctrine unless you know doctrine to begin with. And the early church made a very clear point of it that they tested things in accordance with the doctrine that they knew. If you don't have a doctrinal basis, you can't make judgment. You can't do it. In the book of Acts in chapter 15, the early church uses this basis actually at the Council of Jerusalem. If you go back to verse 12, you will notice and all the multitude kept silent. They were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, as it is written. We have heard his case, we have examined this in the light of doctrine that we know, teaching, and we know that what he has said is in accordance with it. But how can you make that judgment if you don't understand doctrine? How can you do it? How do you do it? Listen, there wouldn't be so many Christians today getting themselves involved in all of the facets of meditation systems and things if they had a proper understanding of the doctrine of man or even starting to consider the realms of reincarnation. If we really did a decent concept of the doctrine of person as it exists biblically, we wouldn't have half of these problems. But because we don't teach basic doctrine regarding these areas, people have no way to discern when someone says, try this, try that. They don't have the doctrinal basis to discern the correct from the false. You have to know doctrine today to be able to discern right from wrong, true from false. But secondly, you have to know doctrine too when people say, would you explain to me this particular doctrine? Would you explain the reasonableness of it presented? Could you do it? And this is the tremendous challenge that we face as well. Well, so far, differences, you've got to show differences in order to reach people. If there's no difference, no communication, no evangelism, and please, don't let people go to hell thinking they're saying the same thing that you are playing a game. Secondly, when it gets down to the pages of Scripture, you have to now interpret the Word of God and show these people where they're wrong, what's right the true interpretation and you have to know the doctrines to be able to express them to these people but the last realm has to do with evidence you really need to know the reasons for why you believe what you do in Acts chapter 2 is the passage we used yesterday morning we used the realms of history and prophecy now I'll not go back through those passages for you but nonetheless the early church was very quick to give a reasonable basis for why it was true now there are people that you're going to face who are going to say to you in our day and age, well, you see, we have this revelation, divine principle. Or we have these revelations, Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price. You see, we really don't buy the Bible, just the Bible. We have these other ones in addition, where they clarify what the Bible says. Now, the question that we need to bear in mind here is, number one, we have to know why the Bible is true why Christianity is true and you, ought, you also will need to give some reasons as to why someone else's basis is false is false for example one of the interesting cases has to do with Mormonism that I'd like to just illustrate for you in our time Mormonism has an interesting little booklet out it's called What Mormons Think of Christ and in this particular booklet they run the gamut of running what I call the coattails of the Bible. They run on the back of that and then simply leap off into Mormonism from it. But if you really listen closely to what they're saying, you would discover that the evidence doesn't back up what they're saying. For example, in the, this little booklet, What Mormons Think of Christ, in the beginning of the booklet you will get the statement from Ezekiel chapter 37, where it talks about the Bible and the Book of Mormon being one. 
And that booklet says these are both ancient books. They are revelations from God. And both of these books concern ancient people regarding Jesus' visit to them. Now that part is true. That part is true regarding the fact that their account of Jesus and their claim at revelations and things like that. But then as you begin to look at these claims, you start to see the difference. You go a little bit further in the book, and all of a sudden this book comes out and says, Now, there are many prophecies in the Bible, but equal or prophecies of equal value are found in the Book of Mormon. That is not true. Not true. The prophecies in the Bible have either come to pass as they have been stated, or they're still pending at a future time. There is no one prophetical mistake in the Bible. But in the Book of Mormon, for example, Alma 7.10, the Book of Mormon says that Jesus was to be born in Jerusalem. The wise men went to Jerusalem. He wasn't born there. They were sent somewhere else to Bethlehem. The Book of Mormon has prophetical mistakes. Now, am I to accept the Book of Mormon as equal to that of the Bible? Not on the basis of evidence will I do that. Not whatsoever. But then I read a little bit further in that booklet. And it comes to the place of the resurrection of Christ. And it says, now, there are accounts of the resurrection of Christ in the Bible. And they name some of them. There are post-ascension accounts on Damascus Road to Saul or to Paul, and then also in the realm of coming down to the Isle of Patmos to John. But then it says equal or superior accounts. It gets a little bit more superlative as it goes along. Equal or superior accounts are found in the Book of Mormon. That too is an absolute lie. First of all, the Bible itself, I know the writers. The growth of New Testament documents, for example, existed in history. There were people afterward that wrote about them, their integrity, that they were on the scene, they were eyewitness people that were there, they knew what they were talking about, all of the things clicked together. I have the Book of Mormon, I look at that, I don't know those people ever existed. There's not one other person in history that ever knew any of them or talks about them. There's archaeological evidence to the contrary. One of the biggest battles in Mormonism right now is the fact that the Book of Mormon isn't talking about America, it's talking about Mesoamerica down Central America. We're still trying to figure out how the plates got to Palmyra, New York. Nibley has the best explanation. The angel carried them from down there up to there. Okay? Now, I am to accept the Book of Mormon as equal or superior to the Bible. When the Bible has archaeology that backs it up, all the prophecies are correct, history is true, all the evidence, Mormonism, no support of evidence, and evidence to the contrary. How could anybody make such claims? But I'm simply telling you that when you're talking to these people, you better be able to illustrate why the Bible is true, and you better be able to show reasons for why their revelations and their things are false. Same thing with the divine principle. The moon people have many times said to me, but after all, you know, we have revelations of Reverend Sun Myung Moon. Well, if you wanted to put revelations to the test, let's put them to the test. Reverend Moon says that Jesus rose as a spirit from the grave. He did not raise bodily, but he rose as a spirit man. The interesting part is that history records the fact, eyewitnesses, Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Now, I to take the word of some particular spirit that speaks in the Revelation and deny what history says? Or am I to cast shadow, doubt upon the Revelation that Moon receives? What they're literally asking me to do is on the basis of some whim that he's had subjectively, deny what actually exists historically. And that's amazing that people would do that. And they get very upset when you point it out to them. Very upset. Well, in this structure, say, the four big areas that we're working on today, that we need to develop inside the church in Christian education, is first of all, we've got to learn and begin to realize the language problem that confronts us. We have to recognize these people use our language and they'll mean the same thing by it. And we have to realize also that these people have different mindsets. And they will interpret what we're saying and reinterpret it to fit their patterns. And if you're not careful, you won't pick up the differences in what they're doing. 
You need to show differences to reach people for Jesus Christ. Secondly, you need, when it gets down to the pages of Scripture, to know how to interpret the Bible correctly. Correctly. Thirdly, you need to be able to express the doctrines in the Bible and learn them. Fourthly, you need to know why Christianity is true. You also need to be able to demonstrate why other bases of other religions are false. Now, the antidote that I've put here is one that needs to be remembered and uh, something that you need to drill into your life. The concerned Christian worker must familiarize himself with the terminology of the major cults if he is to enjoy any measure of success in understanding the cultist mind and in bearing a fruitful witness for Christ. You don't have to learn about every cult, but you better get some idea of what cult people can do and how they misuse terminology so you get a basis of experience to work when you get out into the field with other movements and when people speak. The average cultist knows his own terminology will carefully avoid such explosive issues as the deity of Christ, the atonement, or the physical resurrection. Every cultist that comes to talk to you will try to avoid those areas. He'll tell you what his is about in the general way of works and you should get involved with Jehovah and they'll try to sound pretty much like you. They all avoid showing differences. They all want to sound like you and try to draw you into what they are. If cornered, then they will redefine the terms to fit the semantic framework of orthodoxy. They will simply just use their words. They'll use your words. They'll reinterpret them unless you force them unless you force them to explicitly define the terms. Secondly, you need the informed Christian worker must seek for a point of departure. That's the point of difference. You don't have that, you're not going anywhere in evangelism. Where he can get the differences out in the open. The trained Christian worker then will seek to explain and demonstrate the truthfulness of the gospel of Christ. Why Christianity is superior. The genuine Christian worker labels patiently and if need be exhaustively with the cultist who is really interested in finding out the truth. Listen, when you're working with a cultist, keep a goal in your mind. Don't wander off. Your goal is to reach him for Christ. If the conversation gets into argumentation and it seems like he's playing a game, do me a favor. Simply stop him at that point and say, look, you're not really interested in seriously talking about this. There's no sense going any further. It'd be one of the best things that you do for them. Because at that point, what will happen is say, well, let's get into the passage and look at it. And you'll, you'll get a place to talk with them and begin to work. This little attentiveness is very important. I remember the, the story of an old farmer who sat on the fence watching a, a man trying to move this mule that he bought. And he tried to pull him from the front. He got a shoulder behind tried to push him from the back. He yelled at him, cursed at him, and everything else, and the mule didn't move. The farmer just was splitting over this whole thing. Finally, the farmer just looked at it after the guy was wearied. The farmer went over, picked up a two-by-four, whacked him in the head, and said, Move! And the mule just took off and started to move. The other guy said, he said, How'd you do that? He said, Very simple. All you have to do is get his attention first. Sometimes people get so involved in the argumentation, they're thinking about what they're going to say next, they don't hear what you're saying. Stop them. Break the thought. Did you hear what I say? Explain it back to me. Well, that's embarrassing sometimes for them. Okay? Stop them Say, you know, look, you're not listening to what I'm saying. You're not being honest. Is there any sense in going any further? You simply have to do that at points. And the other realm to this is the fact that I would say to you too, be sure that if you're working with a cultist and you're making headway, that you get his name and address and telephone number. Because that person will never be back to see you again. If he gets down to the congregation, Jehovah Witnesses, they'll send them somewhere else. If he gets down to this particular movement, he's not going to be back. Generally, these people don't get back to see you. And if you don't follow them up and call them and show interest and show love, you're going to have a difficult time reaching these people for Christ. The task of the Christian worker is twofold, both to preach the word of God, to contend earnestly for the faith, but always in the spirit of Christian love that will breathe concern for those ensnared by Satan and taken captive by him at his will. Now, discernment of language problem, interpretation of the Bible, doctrine, evidence, reasons for why Christianity is true. These are all areas that you need to develop and you need to learn to be the witness that God would have you be today. And there's no reason why you can't do it. The people in the early church did it. They didn't have PhDs and EDDs and all of the rest. 
They were common, working, average lay people, but they were capable of gradually building themselves up and developing these principles. There is no reason for why you can't develop these areas. And God will only use the best tool that's available, and you need to sharpen yourself up for the battle that's here today. The only possible reason that you're going to have is simply the fact that you don't want to do it, because there isn't a person here tonight that couldn't learn to be more discerning, that couldn't learn how to properly interpret the Word of God, that couldn't learn to express the doctrines of the faith, and that couldn't learn reasons for why you believe what you do. 